doing a wedding uh, in Hartford, Connecticut at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, the very beautiful art museum in Hartford. It's unusual to do a wedding that's not in a church, but um, it was for some family friends, and this was a particular um, wish of theirs, and I, I, I did do the wedding. And one of the things that in doing the wedding I allowed, which I don't usually do in the church, which is to have a wedding coordinator that I don't know. <laughs> because wedding coordinators have a way of trying to run the show. <laughs> and I am the priest, and I like to run the show. <laughs> so this wedding, I missed the rehearsal because my flight had been delayed because of storms. So I really didn't know much about it and was just set up in this beautiful gallery and all the chairs. And, and I, I, I said, the wedding creator needs to be a part of this because I haven't seen the space. I don't know anything about it. And she's the one who walked them through the ceremony. And so, you know, I, I'm dealing with the whole concept of a wedding coordinator. So during my homily, um, I'm ashamed to admit that a priest, not just me, but I know other priests who will admit the same thing, that there are times when you can be preaching a very uh, theologically, spiritually sound sermon, but in the back of your head something else is going on. And in the time of my homily, the photographer was standing over to the side. <clears throat> Normally I'd make them stand towards the back, but okay, I don't really have control here. It's not my show. It's not, it's not, you know, the church that I'm used to. And he's standing over to the side. And during my homily, the wedding coordinator came up and proceeded to have a protracted conversation with him. <laughs> and I am preaching a sermon for these friends who are very dear to me. But in the back of my head, I am stamping my feet. <laughs> I am righteously indignant. This is why. This is why we don't allow outside wedding coordinators. This is why we work with Linda. Because Linda knows how to do it. <laughs> this wedding coordinator had the gall, she has no respect for what's going on here, to come over and have this conversation during my homily. And I admit that it felt pretty good to be right. It affirmed everything I believed about these outside wedding coordinators who are great getting you to the door of the church and great keeping you from the door of the church, but in here, no one. So even after the ceremony, as I'm rejoicing with my friends, I am still in the back of my head being righteously indignant. Healed the man and brought 
him back from the dead, the widow's uh, son, your only <coughs> son. So he might have heard all of this and said, I really want to meet this guy. I'll invite him to dinner. He may also have been saying, hmm, he's the get. He's the one you want. Everybody's going to look at me and think how wonderful I am because I managed to get the guy that everybody's talking about to come to my table. <coughs> Maybe, like other times when we hear about the Pharisees in the Gospels, he is thinking, i got to find something on this guy. He can't be as good as they say. I'm going to trip him up. We don't know. All we know is that he invites Jesus to his house for his dinner, and they are sitting at the table. Now, there are many things when you have a dinner party that are the unspoken rules, the etiquette about arriving on time and, and bringing something if you're supposed to bring something and sitting appropriately. And sometimes there are, you know, don't eat before that person eats or don't sit at the head of the table and kind of all these unspoken etiquette uh, rules that, that are important. What happens? This woman comes in and breaks every rule of polite society. First of all, she's crashing the party. This woman's not invited. She is not on the guest list. And she just walks in. She doesn't even have the, 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 the uh, sense of self to like, hide in the back. Try to slip in unnoticed. She goes directly to Jesus. And then she does something that is so awful that they can't even imagine it. She kneels at his feet. She bathes them with her tears and she takes down her hair and wipes his feet with her hair. And then she kisses his feet and anoints them. See, this is pretty much <clears throat> the worst thing that can happen. And Simon is righteously indignant. But he's doing it in that way, like I was doing, where you were righteously indignant inside your head. And it says, he says to himself, if Jesus knew what kind of woman this was, this sinner, Simon knows I don't know if it's because he knows her or he knows of her or just because of what she's doing, but he knows that she is a sinner. Simon is seething with righteous indignation. And maybe he's thinking, ha, now I have, now I have the, the uh, information I need to oppose Jesus. Jesus follow those rules of etiquette. He doesn't sit back and just kind of, you know, try to diffuse the situation. He understands what Simon is doing, and he calls him on it. Simon, I have something to say to you. Jesus says. Simon says, teacher, please go ahead. And then Jesus tells a parable. How often does Jesus tell the parable? Because it is so much easier to get pulled out of ourselves when we're talking about somebody else. And Jesus said, if you have two people who are in debt, and one is in debt 500 denarii, and one is in debt 50 denarii, and the debts are forgiven, who's going to be more thankful? Simple question. The person who, who had the 500 denarii is likely going to be the one more thankful for having their debt forgiven. Makes some sense. And that's what Simon says. And then Jesus. Jesus doesn't sit back and let that stew. He actually says out loud. He, in essence, goes up and calls Simon on his righteous indignation and said, What kind of host are you? You're sitting here so worried about what a bad guest she is? You didn't provide me water for my feet. You didn't kiss me when I was to greet me. Why are you judging this woman? Notice that Jesus doesn't ask her what 
she's done. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't say to her even uh, that, that she must repent. He just says, your faith has saved you. Your sins are forgiven. This woman, this woman understands forgiveness in a way that Simon doesn't. Because she understands her need for forgiveness. Simon says, what kind of forgiveness do I need? Same as me being in that wedding and I'm thinking, why would I need to apologize? Well, perhaps because of all the things in my head I was saying about that wedding coordinator who was doing her job. Forgiveness is something that doesn't often feel as good as the opposite. Righteous indignation, I was talking with somebody right after the 8 o'clock service, and they were saying, oh, they feel righteous indignation in their head and forgiveness in their heart. And I said, for me, it's often the opposite. Righteous indignation is right here. It's in my gut. That's where I want to go. And sometimes it takes my head to intervene and say, forgive. Forgiving is hard. Forgiving takes practice. Forgiving is often uh, giving forgiveness that's undeserved or unasked for or unearned. But I do it. And the reason is because Jesus doesn't withhold it from me. And my blessing that I bring from Luke chapter 6 uh, where Jesus says, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. And it says, forgive and you will be forgiven. It's not that Jesus won't forgive you if you're not a forgiving person. It's that you can't accept it. In that moment when my righteous indignation was quashed, forgiveness was necessary. mercy, one of my very favorites. <clears throat> There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There is kindness to his justice, which is more than liberty. Somebody said, you know, when we were kids, we used to sing it, there's a wildness in God's mercy. <laughs> and I think I'm going to sing that for now. Because as good as it feels at time to be right, that's not nearly as important as feeling repentant or feeling forgiven or to forgive. I learned something that day about myself and it wasn't a very nice thing. We all have those moments when we feel righteously indignant. We all have the temptation to hold a grudge, and it often takes